Thank you. I'll try to be brief. Um, so um, I'll take a couple of minutes to talk about the bank, but I'm actually going to talk about a couple of things that sparked me after reading uh, their book. And I have to say that um, it's great that the book makes such a attempt to summarize a lot of knowledge that we have somewhere there about what works for gender and what doesn't in a one single place in social protection. Mm -hmm. and, they, and what is relevant for women, what is relevant for a policymaker, and what is relevant from the political economy side. So um, from the World Bank World Development Report, if you ever saw this at some point, it was an analytical framework. And basically what we were saying here is that in order to achieve gender equality through development policies that little all can, you need to tackle these barriers that impede movement in three different uh, institutional areas. The informal institutions, this is norms, roles, um, so uh, market, uh, the division between market and care work and others, the dynamics of the markets, which uh, provide differential access to land, assets, credits, and others, and the formal institutions of the states, how services are delivered, but also how <coughs> services are designed. All this came through the household where basically allocations of times time and resources happens because this is where people make the rational decisions. So any program will actually be seen through the household eye uh, and actually weighted in terms of, is it gonna increase economic opportunities for me, for my children, for the woman in the house? Is it gonna increase agency for everyone? Whose agency <laughs> is the most relevant one? Which endowments do I want to build on? So um, it actually, I think that the analysis that you guys do place pretty nicely with our analytical framework. Now, what are the main barriers that they identify? And I want to start with a quote from our qualitative research that I've been dying to put on a slide. Mm -hmm. This is um, an adult man in Vietnam who says, frankly speaking, women here are very miserable. They suffer from a lot of pressure. Pigs scream, kids <laughs> cry, and husbands ask for sex. <laughs> there you go. There is the farm, there is the care, there is the husband, there is the power. Um, and actually, the main barriers that they identify in the book in terms of preventing women to fully um, uh, take advantage of social protection are their care responsibilities, their life cycle vulnerabilities, their human capital level, and the access to productive assets and inputs. What are we doing at the bank? And I'm gonna take two slides to talk about the bank and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, there's a new social protection strategy that was uh, for the 2012-2022, wow. Well, period, which focused on three areas, resilience, equity, and opportunity. And actually, it takes a life cycle approach. And um, the scheme underneath shows more or less what are we thinking in terms of life cycle. But it also I enhances the issue of developing tools to help policymakers to do a better work. First of all, analytical tools like steps, which basically details <coughs> the different steps to design a good policy, and data tools such as ADEPT and ASPIRE. ADEPT is a software that um, has a set of indicators on gender equality and empowerment that was developed and actually uses data from household surveys. And ASPIRE does the same, but for social protection indicators such as beneficiaries, uh, type of assets, number of grants, and others. So what we've been challenged for at the bank is to move from design to implementation. So the figure that you have is how do we rate our gender-informed projects by different sectors from uh, three years, 10, 11, and 12. And as you can see, pretty much everywhere, um, gender-informed projects have gone up. Uh, but what do we mean by this? We mean project design. This is gender-informed in the analysis, gender-informed in the actions, and gender-informed in the monitoring and evaluation design of the program. But as uh, the authors have on page 107, translating a program design into practice is an imperfect science. And actually, programs have to interact with what happens on the ground, socioeconomic institutions, cultural conditions, and systems. And even a good gender-sensitive design will not always translate into gender equitable impacts. So the whys, and this is I'm gonna talk about three things because what empowers women may not always be the same that empowers men, maybe. Because there are norms in between and because we need more evidence. So let me talk about what empowers people first. Um, we just uh, finished in this book 
a huge survey. We did 20 countries, about 4,000 individuals talking about what makes them feel empowered, move up on the ladders, on a power ladder in their communities. Um, it's not very clear, but basically these are the average answers for what are the characteristics of someone who sits at the top <laughs> of a ladder of power and freedom in a community, the middle and the bottom. Um, and actually, a couple of unexpected findings. Men and women get empowered by the same things. They all need um, economic assets. They all need an occupation. They all want harmonious marital relations. Um, they all need education and social networks. However, the combination of these things is different for men and women. Men, because of their breadwinner role, because of the need to provide for the families, we, we may disagree with the idea, but men still feel that this is what they have to do, um, depend a lot on the local economy and any program that's going to give them a stable job or stable income for the families. Women get empowered even when there are not that many economic opportunities, as long as they can get out of the house and do some work, even if it is a bad job under the eyes of a man. If, they, if violence decreases in their household, if they get out of their communities and are able to talk to other women. So um, the pressure that comes from social norms in this case actually prevents men to feel empowered far more than women. We found communities in uh, urban areas where opportunities were lacking, where women were still feel feeling empowered because they had education, because they had more opportunities to walk around freely or to talk to other women. <coughs> so this actually will impact <coughs> what happens with the program. And again, here, beauty and gender inequality is in the eye of the beholder. And we need to be accountable for our own male <coughs> in the head, for the ones that have read the gender literature. And two examples, the South African Old Age Pension Program. Um, there's two different findings. So this is a cash sort of transfer subsidy for old, for old people, 60 to 65, for women at 60, for men at 65. It gives them more or less the same amount of money actually women get a little more. And there's two different findings. When the grandmother gets the money, the girls are increase, increase their uh, nutrition to the point that they actually uh, close the gap between a South African girl and a North American girl. That said, we all know that giving money to women, it's beneficial for children. There's no impact on boys. When the grandfathers get the money, education of boys increases and boys work less. There's no impact on girls. Which of these two sides is a good gender policy? Um, how do we read this policy as gender blind, gender sensitive, or gender aware? It is good for children, boys and girls. It is good for grandparents. It is good for the, fam for the households where they live. Um, we could have thought that this had some shortcomings in terms of being gender blind to um, let's say, the foregone income that women had because of being main care providers. Um, the fact that grandmothers care more for their grandchildren than grandfathers do. Um, we may think that education is more important than nutrition, or nutrition is more important than education. Um, so it's just an open question to slightly problematize. <laughs> Another uh, program, Mexico Estancias Infantiles, that um, the authors discuss at length. Um, two impact evaluations show slightly different things. First, for women that were working, and this was the main objective of the program, uh, they got more stable jobs and even increased their income. Um, they reduced their time on childcare. Men did too, but unemployed fathers who were married to these women were less likely to re-enter the labor force. So there's a negative gender impact among all the positive gender impacts. And the prevalence of disease among children uh, rose by 17 percent. Yeah, they're in the child care center. We all know that kids get sick in the child care center. Um, yet again, there's another sort of negative impact. Why is it important? Because it interacts with perceptions of what, a good, what good parents are. Because the woman sees that her kid is getting sick, she may actually decide not to join the labor force and, get and take the children back home and care for them at home. So although we have the best intentions, sometimes our best intentions don't get too far. <laughs> and I will add an additional one on CCTs. Um, we talk a lot about how CCTs uh, reproduce gender inequalities and reproduce uh, 
the caregiver role of women. I've actually read through every possible operational manual of um, Mexico, Progresa and Oportunidades, and Brasil Bolsa Familia. Nowhere there, nowhere is written that the mother is the one that has to take the kid to school or that has to take children to the health center for the checkups. What it says is that the cash transfer is given to the mother and that the household is to collect that, ca that cash transfer at X given times. So when we criticize those programs, we're doing it from our own gender perceptions that they're reproducing gender inequalities because they are giving the money to women, but they're not forcing women to be the ones to take children to school. And there is an interesting example in Brazil where they experimented where, where to build the childcare center, at the center of the favela or at the entrance of the favela. Built at the center, women were the ones taking the children to the childcare center. Built at the entrance, men were doing it on their way to work. So it's a program feature, it's a program design, but also is on the eyes on the designers of the program and also the ones that evaluate the programs. Um, we actually need to be more careful about when we look at these things. And what could happen if, say, for uh, Juntos or um, any other CCT, um, the health post was to be open on Saturday morning or was to be open late for fathers? Or what if we condition it for fathers to take their children to the health checkup? I mean, there are different ways that we could start thinking about these things. Um, and this is because not everything is visible for a policymaker. <coughs> Policymakers care about the coverage, the affordability, the quality, the institutional implementing capacity, the bang for the buck. That's what they need. Uh, what is not always visible for them, the intersecting and overlapping inequalities. In many cases, they don't talk to the other, to the ministry next door that cares about women or the one on the other side that is concerned about indigenous. They sometimes don't care about time cost and constraints for women. So there is a time issue about that you have to take into consideration. There's also time constraint. Mobility is a constraint. And mobility in a city is a huge constraint. Public transport is a problem. We don't always consider this in social protection programs. Uh, related infrastructure, alternative cost, um, and decision-making process of all poor households. I mean, a poor woman will sit and think about this twice. How much is going to cost me in terms of income, distance? Who's going to take care of my house? And there's one thing that we keep forgetting, and that is insecurity. It's not always about children. It's also about assets. Who stays in the house making sure that the TV or the refrigerator that we just bought doesn't get stolen? Who is there looking after things? And what is lacking? Data. A look at our own gender frameworks and beliefs and the role of norms. So, yeah. I knew it was going to go over time. A couple of quick examples. Social interactions are important, and here um, uh, role models are critical. This is an example from Nicaragua. Basically, if you were living next to the community leader that got the money, you made more money just because you were talking to your community leader, the female community leader. Um, my final point, a new focus maybe, if this is something that we've been exploring, aspirations. And mentions from Aparurai, Ray, Fernandez, and Fogli, aspirations are important to mobilize the capacity to aspire. This is, this is an impact or a result that we don't always see when we quantify data. Um, and this is something that we keep finding. So uh, maybe, yes, I want to get to college. Maybe I'm not going to achieve it in my lifetime, but I want my children to go to college. So one example, which is important, um, on your, the one with the arrows, because <laughs> I don't know which is reference right. It's uh, from a paper by Stefan Dergon on Young Lives Projects. And he looks at Peru, Ethiopia, and India at the aspirations of parents transmitted to children. So by age eight, children have the aspirations, have their own aspirations and parents have some. By age 12, the aspirations of children are the same as their parents. By age 15, <coughs> these gender gaps, these aspirations are transmitted or reflected in genders in scores, in test scores, differentiated by gender and a lower self-efficacy for girls at age 15 in countries such as Ethiopia and India. On the other side is from our research, what do rural boys and rural girls aspire to achieve in terms of education? Girls want to get to college. Boys too, but not as much. And a final quick quiz. This is the quiz. Please, please fill in the blanks. Women perform X percent of the world's work and produce X percent of the food 
uh, yet earn only X percent of the income and hold X percent of the wealth. I'm sure every one of you has a number for that. Another one, women make up X percent of the world's poor and X percent of the world's illiterate. Increased gender equality by X percent will increase growth by X percent. We've all seen these statements with tons of different numbers in them. Um, actually, not all of them are real, not all of them are truth, most of them are not. These are numbers that we cannot estimate. And while, oh, there's another one. Women own or hold X percent of the world's land, ti title land, wealth, assets, you name it. It's normally around 1%, something like that. Why do we do it? Because people respond to emotional triggers. And we've been advocating for gender equality for a long time. And we need to get the message out. And we need to trigger actions among people. But what happened with policymakers? They are not responding to this anymore. They're not responding to this because they get that message, but the message that they don't get is that they don't know how to do things. So three final points. We don't know how to do things for women. <coughs> Empowerment sometimes is not agency, and some opportunities are not enough. Um, and my time is up, so <laughs> I'll leave it here. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um,